Greetings, I'm your host, Dr. Wolfula, with a review of the brand new Texas Chainsaw Massacre sequel released on Netflix. I don't really know where to begin with this video, but I guess I should start by saying that I am very biased. The original 1974 Texas Chainsaw Massacre is my favorite horror film of all time. It's fantastic. A brutally real vision of a cannibalistic family with gritty cinematography, disgustingly immersive art design, and dedicated performances by its cast of memorable lunatics. It's a masterpiece, but it's an often misunderstood film, especially by many of its own sequels. I love part two for being its own weird, fun thing with Bill Mosley's Chop Top stealing the show. Dog will hunt! Get that bitch, Leatherface! Get that bitch! <laughs> Dog will hunt. And I like the third film, despite going way too Hollywood. But past that point, I can't personally get behind any of the subsequent Texas Chainsaw films beyond the first two sequels. Though they do all have their fans, of course. I don't want to take away from anybody's enjoyment of the later films. <laughs> That said, at this point, I feel like this series is cursed. And with this new movie, that not only hasn't changed for me, but the 2022 Texas Chainsaw Massacre is now my least favorite film in the series. Okay, maybe it's not as bad as Leatherface, but I try to forget that one happened. And hey, at least Matthew McConaughey had fun in Next Generation. <laughs> Was anybody having a good time making this new movie? The new Texas Chainsaw Massacre tells the story of a uh, group of young San Francisco entrepreneurs, aka shitty social media influencers, who have essentially bought a derelict desert town in Texas by the name of Harlow, with the intention of diabolically kicking out any of its existing residents in order to flip the properties to investors and open up some trendy shops and restaurants. Think about it. We can own all of this. Call it Don Tope. What? What? Yeah, people will really want to drive out in the middle of nowhere to patronize these future establishments. Brick and mortar businesses are thriving after all. So yeah, the main characters are pieces of shit, and there's nothing really relatable about their story. What they're doing doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me as motherfuckers in their mid-20s. Shouldn't they be out eating ass or something? Why are they trying to run a town? It makes even less sense because they're all in on flipping this town with the investors showing up literally right away. But it's the first time they've ever even been been to this town. All it needs is young blood, people like us, tired of the big city, looking for a fresh start. It's a huge step to move 2,000 miles to open a business in a place you haven't even been to before. I, I don't want to live here. Your whole idea is insane. You don't know what you want. Okay, and you do. I gotta also say that the town itself, the central location of the film, is terrible. It just looks like an obviously fake Main Street set that you'd see on a Universal Backlot tour. Behold the joys of late stage capitalism. I can see why they shot this flick in Bulgaria. It's ultimately cheaper to build a shitty set of a town in another country than deal with buying the pesky permits and shutting down streets involved with shooting in a real Texan town. Who needs authenticity when you can save a few bucks? Woo! The first 10 minutes of the movie weren't so bad, though. It actually showed some promise with its mock true crime documentary opening narrated by John Larroquette. Of the five young victims, only one survived. It felt like maybe we were going to take a deep dive into the original film's mythos. And the characters weren't completely abhorrent to begin with, but everything just comes crashing down when the movie introduces inept social commentary as the film's inciting incident. The young adults encounter, gasp, a Confederate flag in a backwoods Texan town? Are you serious? We have a bus full of potential investors on the way here. If they see this flag, they're not gonna buy. What are you fucking expecting? Like, how sheltered are these characters from reality that this didn't even cross their mind as a possibility? I'm definitely not a fan of Confederate flags myself, but I'm in touch enough with reality to know they literally come with the territory. It leads to a real comedy of errors where they take it upon themselves to remove the flag from the creepy building that turns out to still be occupied by an old lady and her hulking man-child charge. What was this about? My flag. It's one of those things where the movie tries to awkwardly straddle the line with social commentary on a really touchy subject in America today, playing it safe enough to where nobody is really right in this situation. The sick old lady has some backwards racist views, of course. I don't have a problem with Negroes. 
but the young adults are forcing her on the spot to remove her flag and also forever leave the property she's lived in her entire life with nowhere else to go. Literally five minutes after these fucking Gen Z kids arrive in town. Look, you'll be safer in a home and, and better taken care of. Now, guess what? The main characters are garbage for kicking a sick old lady out to the curb. And the Confederate flag issue, the lady's casual racism. You watch your mouth, boy. They didn't need to be in the movie at all just to try to reframe the situation more in favor to the influencers. They could have just focused simply on the underlying problem. The old lady legally lost her home, was told to leave weeks ago but didn't, leading to natural, organic conflict when these outsider characters arrive and find somebody still living on their newly purchased property, building conflict within the friend group over the ethics of what they're trying to do. It's like they just added the Confederate flag in so the film would be topical, make it quote-unquote elevated horror, but it just feels like a contrived extra layer of conflict distracting from the main issue of gentrification. That's where all the conflict should be generated. It would be an evolution of the original film's far more subtle social commentary about how mechanization puts slaughterhouse workers out of business. The place where they shoot the cattle in the head with that big air gun. Thing. Oh, that, that, that gun's no good. How come? I, I thought the gun was better. Oh, no. With the new way to people put out a job. Forcing a crazed family to turn to cannibalism to survive financially. The Confederate flag issue isn't the only forced social commentary the film has to offer, though. The two main characters of the movie are Melody and her younger sister Lila, along for the ride displacing people from their homes. Wholesome! Melody is an unremarkable Aaliyah Shawkat knockoff, but it's revealed that Lila is a survivor of a school shooting, forever traumatized by her experience. Oh dear god, this movie's really put me on the spot here. It's just a hodgepodge of attempts at social commentary instead of focusing on a single overarching theme like the original film, allowing the horror at the center of the movie room to breathe. Ever shot one before? No. Been shot at. There's just no subtlety to any of this shit, and the satire becomes cartoonish towards the end of the movie when you have a bunch of disconnected millennials witnessing a decapitation, only to take out their phones and threaten to cancel the killer. Try anything you cancel, bro. It's just a total farce. It makes the yuppies from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 seem like three-dimensional characters. He wants to hear bright lights, big titties. Wrong. I don't want to hear it. I want to see it. I enjoy good political and social commentary. It can add so many extra layers of depth and meaning to a story. I'm not one of those idiots that's like, don't put politics in movies. But when I see it done so ineptly and in such a cowardly way like this film, I just can't fucking stand it. I mean, anyone who blasts diesel into the atmosphere like that truly gives zero fucks about, like, anything. Let's just move on. The old lady inevitably dies of a broken, racist heart, and the hulking man-child by her side is, of course, Leatherface, who was shown earlier in the movie unmasked, and I gotta say, Leatherface is pushing 80, but he looks like a guy in his 50s. He must have a great skincare routine. I mean, he is Leatherface, after all. He'd have to. <laughs> And, well, after crudely fashioning a makeshift mask out of a fallen cop's face, Leatherface goes into full kill mode, seeking revenge against young adults for the death of his mother. So, yeah, they've just turned Leatherface into Jason Voorhees again, killing dudes much in the same way Jason Voorhees kills dudes, but Leatherface looks like shit in this movie. It's the first time I've seen a Leatherface that doesn't look like a Leatherface to me. He just looks like some zombie guy. It feels like this is a further de-evolution of Leatherface's character. Nobody making these movies now seems to understand what Leatherface is. He should be a victim driven to kill as a last resort and out of fear of retribution from his cruel family. Look at Gunnar Hansen's Leatherface. He was an anxious mess. He's not a fucking killing machine like Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees. It's so weird how the cannibalistic family at the center has been abandoned in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series in favor of trying to turn Leatherface into a generic slasher villain that works alone. Texas Chainsaw 3D was a step in the wrong direction, but I have newfound respect for it because it at least tried to maintain a continuity with the original film. It was pretty sloppy with a lot of holes, but it at least felt like there was an effort to appeal to fans of the original movie, and at least acknowledge that there was a cannibalistic family at some point beyond just with a shitty slideshow and a post credit scene. Also, at least Texas Chainsaw 3D had Marilyn Burns in it before she died. I'm the one who got away. And I'm here to make sure you don't. 
Sally Hardesty, the original survivor of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, is in the new film obviously not played by the now-deceased Marilyn Burns, and it just feels like a pointless addition to the film, tacked on at the last minute. It'd be like if Jamie Lee Curtis was long dead, but they still told the story of Halloween 2018 exactly the same way with somebody else playing Laurie Strode. There's no point. It doesn't mean the same thing if it's not the woman herself. Yeah, it just feels like an executive at Legendary Pictures saw the box office of the new Halloween movies and was like, put the original Survivor girl in the new movie and watch fans flock in droves, not knowing that the original actress was dead. So the makers of the film tried their best to make it work with an actress who looks like a safe approximation of what the character Sally would look like as an old woman. The new Sally does the best that she can, chewing the scenery as a maniacal, revenge-seeking Texan ranger like Dennis Hopper before her. But it just all feels like an afterthought. She only has a couple brief scenes before the finale, and it feels like a disservice to the character to put Sally on the same level of Leatherface as a maniac with a vendetta. Sally wouldn't want revenge. She was happy enough to have survived in the original. She's not like Laurie Strode, where on some fundamental level she would feel she had failed her friends and desperately want to seek closure. It just doesn't work. You don't remember me. And that's a running theme of the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre film. The gritty realism isn't there, the sense of isolation and dread isn't there, the immersive set design isn't there, the memorably deranged performances of a cannibalistic family aren't there either. All of those elements are replaced with artificiality, Hollywood quipping, Hey, motherfucker! fucking grotesque excuses for characters, and failed attempts to add depth through tacked-on social commentary when ultimately behind it all is a by-the-numbers cash grab slashes sequel that wasn't made with love by true fans. I like the recent Scream movie, and I'm loving the new Halloween films. They have their faults, but they ultimately felt like they were made by fans who really loved the previous movies, doing the best they could to deliver worthy follow-ups that do the original movies justice. I don't get that feeling with the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre film, and I had hope for it. Legendary Pictures has a lot of credibility, and Fede Alvarez, the producer and the guy who helped conceive the story for this new film, well, I thought he knew what he was doing. I got a kick out of his Evil Dead remake. I thought he'd make sure to deliver something truly special here, but I was left disappointed in the end. Like literally, the end credits music is just a generic synth track. I give Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2022 a leather fuck out of try anything and you're canceled, bro. You know, I'm fine if there's no more Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies. Put the series to bed now. Oh yeah, and if you've been wondering what I've been up to, I've been making a bunch of new videos that are banked and will be released soon, including my Hatchet 3 review and four new Scooby Doosday videos. I'm currently working on a couple new Crypt Tuesday videos as well, with a review of Victor Crowley on the horizon. Once I've gotten all these current videos finished in advance, I'll start releasing them here on YouTube. See you all again very soon. If you liked this video, like it, and if you loved it, click the subscribe and bell buttons for more vids. I'd also like to thank these fine folks pledged my shout-out tier on Patreon for all their kind support. Videos like this wouldn't be possible without all their help. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Dr. Wolfiel is signing out.